Okay, that looks good. That's it? <laughs> I think. Okay. Do you see okay. a ticker? Yeah. Just counting two. All right, okay. Uh, good evening again. So David Yale Bailey is going to give our feature presentation tonight. Um, David is well known in this organization for giving challenging and sometimes uh, experimental presentations with a lot of physics content. Uh, this is a major activity of his. Some might wonder if it borders on an addiction. <laughs> uh, Dave was in astronomy before he was born. His parents met as graduate students at Yerkes Observatory in the 1930s. Uh, he studied under Carl Sagan and other leading astronomers at Harvard. And uh, we are happy to have him as our resident Einstein. So with, with those, uh, those easy to live up to words ahead of you, I give the floor to Mr. David Bailey. Okay, first of all, people in the back, you can't see the screen. That's okay. If I can see it, then, then I can do my talk. <laughs> Normally I have paper in front of me. This time I didn't make it to the copy place. Um, we'll see if we can get a, a, a better copy of this in the WASP. Uh, if there's interest. Um, let's see, some housekeeping stuff. Um, I like questions in real time. So if you got a question, raise your hand. <laughs> um, the reason why I like questions in real time is if you decide you're going to ask me later, you'll forget what the question was. And if you ask a question which, in my opinion, is of interest only to me and you, I'll say, See me at the, at the meal after the, after the meeting. Um, okay, when worlds collide. Um, well, it's had a nice title, anyway. Um, in this one, our sun counts as a world. And a, an encounter of two bodies within the Roach limit counts as a collision. Um, We've got a chart here uh, that gives target areas for, for solar system objects. <laughs> and the effective target area of the sun is, what is that, 2 million. The sun has 500 times the target area of the whole rest of the solar system. 2 million what? Arbitrary units. Um, oh. Oh, the Earth. Here we go. The Earth has an effective target area of 1.1. So that's 1.1. 1 .1. For every 1.1 object, for every object that hits the Earth, 2 million are going to hit the Sun. So, it's just a ratio. Yeah. So I decided, well, let's simplify this talk. Let's only talk about things hitting the Sun. Because after all, everything else is one in a million. So. What happened here? Geometric target area. Sun has a geometric target area of uh, 12,000. <coughs> but the sun has lots of gravity. It sucks things in which are in orbits which might have missed the sun. So that's why target area geometrically is 12,000. Effective target area is 2 million. <laughs> if you've got something like, uh, like Mercury, it's Effect, it's, it's geometric target area is 0.146. It's effective target area is 0.147. It turns out that Mercury has so little gravity that it hardly sucks in anything that would have missed it otherwise. Um, let's uh, pan up a bit. OK. Um, all projectiles are difficult to launch, and some more than others. And it turns out that the really spectacular ones can't be launched. There's no way of launching Jupiter and crashing it into anything. Jupiter has more angular momentum than the entire rest of the solar system combined. And so forget Jupiter as a, as a, as a projectile. And likewise, Saturn. Um, and Uranus and Neptune. Um, 
The only way you could launch, say, Uranus into an orbit that would make it hit the sun would be if you could find something out in the Kuiper belt that we don't know about yet, that maybe weighs as much as two Earths, and somehow or other wave match one and make that get launched towards Uranus, and then it does a, a gravity slingshot around Uranus and drops Uranus down into and hits the sun. Well, eh, eh. Uh, and I, don't, I don't think so. Uh, for one thing, um, magic wands are, are nice things to have, but magic wands all conserve angular momentum, unfortunately. So you just wave. You can't just wave a magic wand. You got to do it right. And they also conserve uh, kinetic energy. So um, forget the magic wands. Um, and down here, it says, Deus Ex Machina, God from a machine. And if we wanted to drop Jupiter into the sun, we could do it. We have to bring out an, in an outside contractor to do it, because the solar system uh, resources can't do it. Um, so if you brought in a white dwarf star from interstellar space, or a brown dwarf, or a red dwarf, any one of those three, you could do a slingshot around Jupiter and drop Jupiter right into the sun. But, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave Jupiter alone. Um, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to drop the Earth into the sun. Now, if we drop the actual Earth into the sun, we're all dead, of course. Before we even get there, we're dead. Um, so we're going to make a copy of the Earth. We use our magic wand and, and use it in, in copy mode. Make a copy of the Earth and drop the copy and make sure we pick the right one. <laughs> and um, would a copy of the Earth have a copy of us on it? <laughs> Preferably not. Well, what did you gain if it does? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Let's talk about it after the meeting. Again, some Broncos baseless territory here. This thing here is is maybe of interest. Um, Back in that first paragraph, it says um, that this is talking really just an excuse so that I can pre present a kind of a, uh, an assortment of maybe interesting ast astrophysical, uh, astrophysical concepts to you. And um, there's this thing called the great inequality. How many people have heard of the great inequality of Jupiter and Saturn? One, two, two. three. Okay, okay. For every twice that Saturn goes around the sun, it's 29 years, right? Times 2 is 58. Jupiter goes around 5 times. 11 times, comes out pretty close. And so the result is that Jupiter and Saturn are linked by their gravity. 5 times around Jupiter, Saturn twice around. And over a 900 year period, Jupiter and Saturn drift away from the position you might think that they would be in, and then they drift back again in 900 years. So that's why it's called a great inequality, because 5j is not equal to 2s. It's close. Um, and there's a, also an inequality of uh, Uranus and Neptune. Ever notice that? Neptune goes around in 184 years, something like that. <coughs> Uranus goes around in 84, no, 164. Neptune goes around 176. 100 and, what? 176 years. 176. For Neptune. And half 84. of 176 is pretty close to, to one, what, pretty close to Uranus. Uranus. So, so that inequality is a two to one inequality. Um, and it's possible that those, two inequalities either stabilize our solar system a lot or conceivably maybe destabilize our solar system a lot. Uh, I'm not a, um, a, what do you call it, a celestial mechanic. Um, I haven't studied that much celestial mechanics. Um, so I don't know. Um, so if you try to um, move Saturn, by some waving some magic wands or something, you discover that it's a lot harder to move Saturn than you thought because it, it's linked to Jupiter by its gravity. 
you, know, you have to move Jupiter and Saturn. So, so it's a lot harder than you think. Um, let's uh, do a scroll. Um, okay, cool. Um, let me back up a little. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Energy available. No, no, we covered that already. All right. Energy shopping list. Okay, that's a good place to be. Um, let's look for the energy. See what can happen if we collide things. We're going to collide something into the sun. Um, I made a little energy shopping list. Uh, shopping list with people who can't read it back there. Uh, number one, Earth spin energy. It turned out Earth spin energy it is tiny. Totally ignore it. Hmm. Um, number two, Earth's orbital energy. Well, we're moving like uh, it's 18 miles per second, 30 kilometers per second. By the way, it's a useful number, round number. The Earth moves in its orbit 30 kilometers per second. In terms of the velocity of, of light, that's point. Zero, 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 0001. Very close. About a, about a 1% off, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, so um, <clears throat> so Earth's orbital energy, you might think that's large because uh, 30 kilometers per second is a large number. No, that's also negligible. Um, on the other hand, if you stopped Earth in its orbit, and dropped it into the sun. It arrives at the sun going essentially solar escape velocity. And that's like, it's a lot more than the Earth's orbital velocity. So uh, this number three here on our shopping list is Earth's arrival energy as it falls into the sun. That's a significant number. Very significant. It's huge compared to the others. Um, Earth's internal heat is number four. For this hot rock and molten iron. Uh, turns out that's not much. Yes? So you said that the speed of Earth is like a tiny fraction of the speed of light. If you dropped Earth into the sun, what fraction of it would it be compared to the speed of light? Yeah. Um, the The escape velocity of the sun is like 60 kilometers per second. And to get energy, you square that. So, so dropping the Earth into the sun, it arrives with 60 kilometers per second of velocity. 60 squared is 3,600 in terms of energy. Um, and So, and, and also, that's a standard number. If you drop anything, anywhere in the solar system, drop it towards the sun, it arrives at that same speed, about 60 kilometers per second. And, like, if you drop Mercury into the sun, it arrives going a little slower because Mercury's the closest planet. How much slower? About 1%. So, forget the details. Any object you drop into the sun from stationary zero, zero velocity, anywhere in the solar system, it arrives at that standard speed. Simplifies it. Yeah? Is that like nine, nine meters squared per second? The same mathematical gradient for dropping something into the planet? Uh, like nine point is it is it nine point eight one meters per oh, second oh, squared? Oh, the oh, Earth, oh. isn't it? Oh well, yeah. that's that's the acceleration of gravity on the at the surface of the Earth. Yeah. It's the Earth's gravity. Yeah. Uh, but the acceleration of gravity out here, of solar gravity, that's a tiny number. But uh, if you drop anything, it starts accelerating towards the sun. Very gently, but it gets going really fast by the time it gets close to the sun. What are the chances of Earth falling into the sun? Uh, well, you'd have to stop Earth. <laughs> because in order to drop it into the sun, it has to go, like, quote, vertically downwards. If it's going a, even a little bit sideways, it will go in the ellipse and will miss the sun. Oh, it's falling off the time. Yeah. 
taking a look at orbital mechanics, if you were going to slow the Earth, in order to get to the Sun from the Earth, you've got to go faster, isn't it? Well, if you just, if you just faster. What, the way to do it with the least expenditure of energy is just stop the Earth. It's now going. It's, it's now going. It's now going to, you have to stop to go faster, Bob. Yeah. Okay, so you have to. Yeah, you have to uh, accelerate prograde to slow down, and you have like, to slow down a lot suppose, to get in. Suppose I'm holding a golf ball in my hands, and I'm standing right right at the hole. I want to drop the golf ball into the hole. What do I do? I hold it stationary. I let go. I, I dropped it with a velocity of zero. If it has even a tiny bit of cross velocity, it'll miss the hole. What makes the Earth go around the sun? Oh, well, luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Earth has a lot of uh, momentum, and there's nothing stopping it. So it just keeps going around. I mean, there is small effects. There's a solar wind. That's tiny. There's a solar magnetic field. That's tiny. Everything is tiny. So the Earth has been going around for four and a half billion years. So, so in answer to this woman's question, the Earth is not about to follow. No. 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 You would have to expend a lot of energy to get the Earth to stop. Yes. <laughs> well, wait. When the when the sun goes red giant, does that count as falling? Into right. the sun? No. Oh, the sun coming to us. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll talk about that. Still going to get there. We'll talk. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, okay. Earth's internal heat is negligible. Also, yeah. So, are the planets um, revolving around the sun because the solar nebula was was? Rotating? That's the original answer, yeah. That's the but original how did the, why was the solar nebula rotating? Okay, you're starting with something that's like a light year in size, more or less, maybe maybe less, but anyway, a big, big ball of gas, not spherical, it's a blob, call it a blob, not a ball. <laughs> and it gradually contracts from its own gravity, and it is rotating. You can't tell that it's rotating, but it is. And Why is it rotating? Because you grab some gas at random anywhere in the universe and, and look at it carefully, and you'll find that it's not exactly stationary. It's rotating a tiny bit. Why? It's because yeah, that's mass, what it is. Well, the mass is drawing to then itself. Then as, yeah. as it gets smaller, and it will take a million years, say, and the rotation is st still acting. And when it gets really small, it's moving really, really fast. Um, yeah, you, you're, you're doing the thing about the ice skater pulling yeah. on your arms. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah, called conservation of angular. When you pull a plug, plug on a drain, you get a similar yeah. effect of rotation. Yeah. And no, it's not true that a northern hemisphere spins this way yeah, in a drain. Not true. Not true. Yeah. Yeah. With a big enough yeah. drain, it is true. Big enough drain, yes. Like, like the Pacific Ocean. Like the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> like, like if you're, it's like if a mosquito flies over the, the bathtub and the, and the, the, the wind from the mosquito's wings started the, the water turning a little bit, that's going to determine it's going to go clockwise or counterclockwise. So forget the thing about the northern and the southern hemisphere. Um, here is, this is the, the other big one, number five on the energy shopping list, sun's internal heat. The earth will make a big splash when it hits the sun. And a couple of things happen. Uh, this is towards the end of the talk, but let's talk about it now. Um, here's, here's the sun's surface. Here's the earth falling down. And it comes, and it hits the sun. It's the, this is the photosphere of the sun. And it falls through the photosphere, and it's still accelerating, by the way. It's still falling towards the center of the sun. It's going faster and faster and faster, and you say, wait a minute, it's, it's inside the sun. Yeah, but the density of the material here, the density of the material here is like 0. 0.00001 times the density of Earth air. That's not gonna stop anything. Earth is still accelerating, accelerating, going faster and faster, going deeper and deeper into the sun. Um, so 
and it's going really fast, and it's going way faster than the speed of sound in, in, the, in the gas of the sun. So this leaves this cone of empty space behind it. All this stuff here is moving that way really fast. It's been knocked out of place by the, by the Earth coming past. And the temperature out here at the photosphere is 5777 degrees Kelvin. Um, a lot of astronomy books say 6,000 degrees Kelvin. I'd rather round off to a string of sevens rather than a string of zeros because this is pretty much the truth. And it's just easy to remember three sevens as it is to remember three zeros. There's a lot of stars out there with a temperature of 6,000 degrees. But the sun ain't one of them. The sun is right around 5777. It might be 5779, something like that. What's the boiling point in Kelvin's? What's what? Boiling point of water in Kelvin's. A lot of people I don't think under know what Kelvin is. Yeah. Uh, well, um, that's 373 degrees. degrees. Yeah. No, okay. not degrees. Kelvin. 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 Kelvin is Kelvin. Kelvin. That's true. That's true. So I, I don't need to put a, a little circle here. I can erase a little circle. 5777K to a physicist means Kelvin degrees. Okay, but what's the temperature down here? Temperature down here is a lot hotter. Let's say it's 70,000. Mm. No, no, no. More than that. 70, well, it keeps That's going more and, and more and more as you go further down. And so the bright <coughs> light down here, it's really, really bright. And now, why can't we see that really bright stuff down there? Because this material here is opaque. The photosphere is, the definition of the photosphere is where the opaque stuff starts. Mm -hmm. So this bright light can now get out like this. Hmm. It's an incredibly bright flash just because you've pushed the opaque stuff out of the way. And it's a vacuum following the Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's vacuum, yeah. Now, um, <coughs> later on I can uh, list the velocity of sound in different parts of the sun. This, this stuff that is moving out this way, eventually it stops and then it starts coming back like this and closes up that hole. It doesn't close up instantly fast. It stays open for a while. And uh, I haven't finished the calculations yet, but it turns out that stuff like this, which you might think is a trivial thing, stuff like that could destroy all life on Earth if it's too bright. If it's open for too long and it's too bright, <laughs> so um, when we get the uh, complete version of this handout into the wasp, uh, it'll have that kind of stuff in it. So um, why would it why would it destroy all life on Earth? Because so it's it, bright. <laughs> um, so I'm going to what, what what change in brightness would be dangerous for it? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. It's a good thing. You're, you're, you're pushing me ahead here. Um, here is a thing which I have invented called a Sunday. A Sunday, a Sunday is not a unit of cold, like you might think. A Sunday is a unit of, of heat. A Sunday is the entire luminosity of the sun for a period of one day. And you can also have a sun here. Um, if you drop the Earth into the sun, that liberates a lot of energy. What it does is it converts the Earth's velocity, of the, which is equal to the solar escape velocity, converts the energy of that velocity into heat. How much heat? 118 sun years. So, and if, if this is the sun, I'm not sure. I'm just sure if I. The camera yeah, showing me. Show Let's get rid of this. <clears throat> okay. No, it's not very round. There's the center. This is 1.0 solar radii. That's the size of the sun. 
And um, that's about a fifth of it, maybe. One, two, three, four, no, over three. Right about there. That's probably about as far as the Earth can go into the sun if you drop it. <coughs> when it gets to there, yeah. it's encountered 10% of its own mass of solar material. Um, and just so you can sort of get your head around it, when the big meteor blew up over Chelyabinsk, well, not a, it didn't entirely blow up, but it made a bright flash. And then a lot of the mater material continued onwards and some of us found on the ground. Um, at the time of that flash, you can, you can see by looking at the videos of the still shots that do the, you can do the calculations. And you find that at that time, that meteor had encountered 10% of its weight in air. And uh, apparently when that happens, drastic things can happen. Um, in, the, in the case of the meteorite over uh, Chelyabinsk, presumably, well, I should have left that there because that could be the meteorite. There's a meteorite moving this way. And previously, stuff has been coming off it like this. And it's, so it's got this bright trail behind it. But at the 10% point, a whole bunch of stuff sort of came loose. And it might not might have been on one side, or it might have been on both sides. A whole bunch of it came loose. And then it starts spreading out and spreading out. The more it spreads out, the more air it hits. And it like explodes out into the airstream and made that bright flash. Anyway, bottom line, the Earth is going to stop at about 20% of the distance to the center of the sun. And it liberates all of its kinetic energy into heat. And that's 118 sun days, sun, sun years. Of heat. Okay, what does the sun do with that? Well, eventually it's going to go up to the surface, that hot blob of stuff where the, the earth is. This incredibly hot blob of stuff gradually percolates its way up to the surface. When it does, you'll get this bright spot that appears on the sun. Really bright. How much extra luminous, uh, luminosity? Well, it's. Um, 118 years worth. So, how are we going to distribute that through the calendar? Well, we can make the sun twice as bright for 118 years. Do you think that would maybe affect our climate here on Earth? Maybe. I don't think we should opt for that option. I think we would scorch. Yeah. Yeah, when you talk about uh, bright light of uh, a given intensity being deadly, is that analogous uh, when they detonated uh, uh, the nuclear weapon uh, and they found out that uh, much more light was given off than they initially calculated and it was deadly if you're exposed to it? Well, they knew there was going to be a bright flash right, yeah. because they, they'd done the test in, in the uh, desert and they saw the flash. Um, but uh, in the case of the nuclear weapon, it doesn't really matter much how, how quick the flash was. Like if you're standing there and then suddenly there's a bright flash, you can't get under cover because it's over by the time you're already well, yeah, but you're already know, dead. In effect. But if they're let's say two individuals, uh, yeah. same given distance from the initial blast, yeah. one was shielded maybe even by a, a relatively thin shield. Oh yeah. And this would be analogous to that bright light being deadly as you're talking there about. There were in the sun. there were people who had. The print of yeah. their clothing burned into their skin. Right. Or it had a shadow into an object. Yeah. 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 Dave, if you look to your left, you'll see the apocalypse. <laughs> oh, cool. There's the earth going into the sun. Question? Yeah. Wouldn't, would, uh, would it be UV at uh, 70,000 Kelvin? Oh, yeah. You, you most would be, of it be most of UV. Most of it is in the UV. Right? Yeah. But um, just because most of it is in the UV doesn't mean that the visible isn't really bright. Okay. Um, if you draw, make a, a, a curve showing the uh, Planck radiation <coughs> curve, and if you do it in log-log coordinates, 
then it looks like this. This is essentially a straight line. If you make it hotter, this peak moves to the left to a shorter wavelength. Everybody knows that, right? And so the peak looks like that. And this goes down like that. And this part is brighter at all wavelengths. Whenever you, whenever you make the object hotter, this, this line looks like that. So, and if here is visible light, you can see you make it hotter. Well, you get more, more visible, more visible. Um, what's happening now? Oh, okay. There's our going into software. Um, this this software uh, doesn't do doesn't doesn't really do what I hoped it would do. Yeah, do. yeah. And Jeff I, would tell you the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got a question. Yeah. For that bright light, is it localized in that one area, or is it every cell to a Good question. Well, if you could rely on the, the this Earth blob <coughs> here staying put. And then it would rise up here, and it would be an incredibly bright, very small spot. I don't believe that for a minute. It's going to get bigger and bigger as it as it comes upward. It's going to be like that big when it gets up to the surface. So if you're on the other side of the sun, it wouldn't affect you. Well, the sun goes around every month. But we're talking, exactly we're talking 118 years. The sun's going to go around and around and around and around. So there's no way of escaping it. Um, I don't want to make the sun twice its normal brightness for 118 years. Bad idea. Let's make it 10% brighter for 1,200 years. 1,200 years and two times brightness. That's a much better way of allocating that resource of that extra sunlight. Maybe even 12,000 years. 12,000 years 10% brighter, 10% increase. Look at that. That looks more like that looks more like the end of an ice age, 12,000 year period, and the sun is 10% brighter. I think we could survive that. We might not enjoy it. We did. Is there another question? I heard somebody say something. Oh well. Okay. Um, so we go back to text. Sure. All right. A um, couple of interesting things here. What is a Sunday? How do you get your head around it? Well, suppose we had, um, by some strange, strange fluke, we had a day of sun that was missing. So we had two nights instead of a day and a night. Well, that's 0.5 sun days, minus, minus 0.5 sun days. We missed a, a day of sunlight, big deal. Suppose you had two days of sunlight in a row with no night in between. That's plus 0.5 sun days. <laughs> Nothing, trivial. Um, here we've got, let's look at the sunniest month in the entire world. Where and when is that? It's December at the South Pole. The sun just goes around the sky, goes around this direction, because you're in the southern hemisphere. It's 23 degrees above the horizon. It just goes around like that all day. That's the sunniest day in the entire year, in the entire planet. Um, why is it at the South Pole, not the North Pole? Because in southern winter, in southern summer, in southern summer, the Earth is closer to the sun. It's in per close to perihelion. And paradoxically, because look at all the snow and ice. That's the sunniest month in the entire world. But um, that's by time. But the sun is dimmer than like when the. Well, it's shining through more air. When the like if it, this is the, the, the horizon, and uh, no, the, the, let's make this the ground. And here is the sun. And here is where you are. It's shining through a longer distance of air. Let's say the atmosphere goes up about that far. It's going through that much air, whereas when the sun is vertically overhead, the sun is shining through less air. 
90 How much air? 90 miles. What? 90 miles of air right above you. Well, yeah, but it keeps getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Right. In terms of sea level <coughs> air, that is eight kilometers. Eight kilometers of sea level equivalent. Like if, if all the air was as dense as it is at ground level, then it would go up eight kilometers and then it would stop abruptly, like, like, the, like the ocean. The ocean water stops abruptly when you get to the surface. Now, real air doesn't do that. But this is called the uh, scale height of the Earth's atmosphere, eight kilometers. Um, okay, let's go on to the energy shopping list. Oh, we, we already did that, so let's keep on going. The Earth hits the sun fast and heavy, okay. Um, there's the density of the sun's material at the photosphere. It's 0 0.0000025 grams per cubic centimeter. Um, Earth air is 5,000 times denser than the air at the photosphere of the sun. What did I say, 5,000 times? Yeah, yeah one over 5,000. That's why when the Earth falls into the sun, it keeps on accelerating. The Earth doesn't even know anything happens. There's nothing there. It's really comfortably hot. It's yeah. really <laughs> hot and it's really bright, but it's not going to stop anything until you get down to this 20% in thing. Um, we would have been dead before. The well, yeah, and <laughs> let's let's skip forward and talk about the Roche limit. How many people know about the Roche limit? One, two, bunch of here. Like a third. Is it in here? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, just scroll and we'll get there. There is the Roche limit. Is that, is that once you check in, you can't check out? <laughs> yeah. Um, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, here's an assortment of projectiles. Oh. You had it perfect. Right. Went too far. Went too far? Right. Yeah, right there. Fine. That's good. Um, here's an assortment of projectiles. Uranus, uh, as I said, you can't drop Uranus into the sun because it's too heavy and it's going too fast. Uh, there's the Earth, Venus, Mercury, the Moon, Triton, and Enceladus, which are two of the satellites of the two moons. Um, here's the Roach limit. Uh, tell us how close you could fly to the sun before your planet starts to fall apart. And it depends on the density of your of your projectile that you're dropping towards the sun. Um, in case of the Earth, you get a density of 5.52 times water. The Roche limit in solar radii is 1.558. And the numbers vary depending on how dense your, your object is. Uh, Enceladus is made mostly of ice. Density of 1.2. Roche limit is out to 2.591 times the sun's um, diagram. Here's the sun. There's where most of the mass is, right at the core of the sun. Here is the photosphere. Let's recenter it. Okay. I'll go out. One. One point zero zero zero. And what number did I use for the Earth? 1.558. So that's about one and a half. So here's here this invisible sphere around the sun is the Roche limit. If the Earth went closer than that to the sun, it starts to fall apart. There's the Earth moving that way. Once you're inside the Roche limit, what happens? Well, when you're just outside the Roche limit, the planet, which was a sphere, gets pointy. It has a pointy end. It's like a football. With a pointy football. Looks like that. When you go inside the... And so this, this material is re, re, reshaping itself. Long before the Earth would get to the Roche limit, things would happen. 
um, tides taller than Mount Everest would be sweeping around the planet. Um, gravity, the gravity of the sun would also make rock tides, which would also be gigantic. Dave? Yeah. Have a look. What you got? Turn around. Look. Turn around. Oh, cool. Uh, that is the Earth breaking itself apart. Because yes. It has yes. Yes. Actually, the, the, the Earth shouldn't be round. It should have the, those pointy things sticking out from it. And material from here, from here, starts falling out. And it falls out. It doesn't fall straight towards the sun. Um, let's see. Let's, uh, let's make the sun, make the Earth moving in that direction. The material comes out and it falls this way. And this material comes out and falls this way. Uh, why does it do that? Basically, centripetal force. Um, not centripetal. Um, Coriolis effect. That's the right, right, right to say it. Yeah. Now, uh, a planet like Mercury, which is made up of more iron, yeah. would it hold up a little bit longer? Well, the density of Mercury is the same as the density of Earth. Okay, I thought it might be more. It's, it's a tiny bit iron. less, actually. Um, so, Long before the Earth reaches the Roche limit, we're all dead. We're drowned in the ocean, and we've been buried underneath landslides. Continental plates. Every 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 mountain has crumbled into, into dust. There is no Mount Everest anymore. Uh, the 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 shape of the Earth now is this particular shape with a point sticking out. Like and this is happening because we're getting close to the gravity of the sun? Yeah, yeah. And it's because the gravity of the sun is greater the closer you are to the sun. And it was devised, this, there's a man named Edward Roche, French physicist, who did this all this calculation in 19, 1850. And in 1850, I don't think they even had hand operated calculators like this, right? Uh, where is he? There he goes. Ken. What do you want? First <laughs> hand cranked calculator Yes. after 1850, right? Yes. So Edward Roach did all his calculation right. Correct. with pencil and paper. And it, it, wasn't, it was 18... 1850. Yeah, 50. It's a number I remember. Here's a summary from the so, People did that kind of stuff. They were called computers back then. My mother was a computer. She was a computer. She didn't operate a computer. She was a computer. At that time, they did have hand cranked calculators. And um, for some reason, it's easier for them to get the women to run the hand cranked calculators than the men. Uh, but that's a social issue, not an astrophysical <laughs> issue. So how long would it take before we know we're going to fall into the sun? <laughs> oh, um, it depends on what kind of instruments you use. Um, the, the GPS guys would know instantly. They'd know within seconds something was wrong. Yeah. Because their GPS all of a sudden doesn't work. Well, it works, but it gives you totally crazy answers. It tells you that you're now 10 miles below the ground level and those kinds of errors. The GPS assumes the Earth is round. Good assumption normally, but <laughs> this thing isn't round. <laughs> so that's the uh, Roach limit. Oh, this one also lists the amount of extra sunlight you get when you drop various things into the sun. For the Earth, you drop the Earth into the sun, you get 118 years of extra sunlight. <coughs> Venus, 96 years. Mercury, six and a half years. And down to this little moon of Saturn, Enceladus, you get 5.8 days of extra sunlight by dropping that into the sun. So why do you get extra sunlight again? Because the thing you drop in has a huge amount of kinetic energy. You get down here and it makes a huge splash like that and it knocks, it makes this <coughs> hole in the sun and it finally stops and it's hot. It's incredibly hot from having stopped. So just like the light you get if 
if a meteor hit, yeah. it yeah. would exactly. <laughs> Except a lot hotter and therefore <clears throat> a lot brighter. Um, want to go? Um, let's back up. <coughs> back, back upwards. Okay. Um, when you come to a, a chart, we'll uh, stop and talk about the chart. Uh, no, uh, sorry, I told you wrong. Go downwards. Okay. Okay. Stop. Okay. How bright and how hot? Well, here is a chart that shows the photosphere. Here is 1.00. That's what the photosphere is. It's one solar radius from the center. So that's the surface of this quote surface, the visible surface of the sun. Here's the temperature. In millions of degrees, it's 0 0.005777. Um, here's the relative surface brightness, one. That's the brightness of the sun, which you're not supposed to look at because you'll blind yourself looking at it. Relative surface brightness, one. At point eight, where the Earth would stop falling, the surface brightness is 1,000 million. Oh, that's not so bright. It's just 3.1 billion times brighter than the sur surface of the sun. That's yeah. hardly bright at all. <laughs> so it's really bright down there. But that's not, nothing compared to the brightness at the center of the sun. This is, OK, 1,000 million billion. Oh, that's only 52 trillion times brighter than the surface of the sun down in the core. Yeah. So when uh, the comet shoemaker Levy fell into Jupiter, yeah. and there was a uh, tremendous upwelling, yeah, and energy really. Too bad we couldn't see it from Earth. Yeah, I know. But if we if we were, were to have, you know been you know or, so you know it was face on to us, yeah. um, that energy was caused basically by um, falling the the, uh, uh, the the kinetic energy of the comet yeah. being you know striking the the cloud tops. Yep. And yep. It was very bright. <laughs> well, cloud tops have nothing to do with it. Forget it, the yeah. clouds. Okay. But it Just think about the, the gas. Yeah. It fell in alphabetical order, too. Yeah, that is. <laughs> How could that amazing. happen? Just by chance. <laughs> and you say that God didn't create the uni okay. universe by chance. Not touching that. No. <laughs> You're not touching that. Um, I don't, well, anyway. Um, here's the sound velocity in kilometers per second. At the surface of the sun, 7.85 kilometers per second sound velocity. At the center of the sun, 510 times, uh, 510 kilometers per second sound velocity. Um, that will come in handy later on when I finish all these calculations and, and finish the report. Um, okay, here we go. The temperature of the sun's center is 2,500 times hotter than <coughs> what we see when we look at the photosphere. Question? I was just trying to count how many zeros. It's eight zeros after 31, you right? Out of, you lose count after a while. <laughs> how many zeros. That's why uh, astronomers use uh, exponential notation. Because mm -hmm. the little number there above the first number tells you how many zeros. Yeah. Um, so the brightness varies as the fourth <coughs> power of the temperature. So. If you go down to where the sun is twice as hot, it's 16 times brighter. Go down to where it's 10 times the temperature as the surface, it's 10,000 times brighter. Things get bright really fast when you go down. Um, what kind of filter would you need if you wanted to observe the core of the sun? Oh. Wow. <laughs> I don't think a regular HL plate, would filter plate, would work. Yeah, plate of steel. <laughs> yeah, well that's true because there's a lot of x-rays. Most of the energy is out here in the x-ray region. Sure. X-rays. Here's ultraviolet. Here's this, this, well, let me see. I'll draw another. <coughs> Actually, the peak, the peak is, the, where is it? It's somewhere around the, the red, isn't it? No. So it depends on whether you're using a log log chart or what. But anyway, uh, visible, not visible here. Visible, infrared. It's something like half of the light of the sun 
it's, it's in the infrared, something like that. Um, okay. Dave? <coughs> yeah. I have a question. Um, Gary Ross and I were, were observing uh, the sun to my each alpha scope about three years ago up at yeah. Cadillac. And there was a, near as we could tell, just a mass ejection material from inside the sun coming out. And it normally, I mean, if you look to H alpha, it's red or black, whatever. But sure. in this particular case, it was an area, a small area, and literally it was so bright to the telescope, white, that you almost couldn't look at it. In fact, we decided to stop looking at it. We don't want to hurt ourselves. That probably would be similar to this, but that's from ejection of material that's probably a solar mass ejection or something that's clearing out a flare or whatever it is. If you're looking at it with a welder's filter instead of H alpha, you'd probably see a white light flare, right? Yeah, well, the H alpha, it was, I mean, this is literally pure white. Even an H alpha is too bright to look at. It's too bright to look at the H alpha. Do you have a question here? She's writing. No, I was just looking at your data there, making some notes and listening. When the wasp comes out, you'll have the whole thing. Maybe you'll have more questions, which is fine. And um, the thing about that, that Ken said, that, that's actually actually my quote. I, I'm Dave Bailey, so th there's two Bailey's laws. Bailey's first law says I can answer any question about astronomy. And Bailey's second law says I don't guarantee that it's right. <laughs> <laughs> and that tells two things about me. One is I know a good bit about astronomy, and number two, when I go, out, I'm willing to go out on a limb, just because it's fun to talk about astronomy. Yeah. But if the, the question is asked, they're not going to know whether you're right or not. Oh yeah, they can look it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and even, even if it's not yet yet determined, right. wait ten years and read an astronomy book, and then say, oh, Dave was wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, the difference between the opposite of light is dark. What what causes a sunspot then? Which would be a dark causes light? what? Sunspot. 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 Oh, cold. cold. Um, yeah, right. Cold. Right. Cold. Contrast <laughs> issues. Cold. The the thing is that um, it's a matter of magnetic field. Um, here's the here's the sun. I made it a little bit curved. This is the convective zone of the sun. The material down here is going always going like this. It's it's like it's like stirred up. And how does the energy get out of the sun? Easy. A blob here that's moving that way is like one degree warmer than a blob here that's moving downwards. When the cool blobs are moving downwards and the warm blobs are moving upwards, energy is coming up. And where there's a, a strong magnetic field, here's a strong magnetic field. <coughs> And it's like pointed towards the center of the sun here. And up here, around the photosphere, it spreads out like this. And you can see, when you're looking at the sun with the appropriate filters, you can see that that's what it looks like. And then the field, field lines go like that. It's like this is a pole of a magnet. You've seen the, the, the diagrams that people make by putting a with the iron filings. The magnets under paper and they sprinkle iron filings on it, yeah. And what happens here? Well, the, the convection is prevented. Here's, a, here's blobs that would like to go upwards. They stop. And they drift sideways. And so the result is that out here, this part of the photosphere is getting getting surf, serviced, the hot blobs are arriving here. So this is full brightness here. Here is what they call the umbra of the, of the sunspot. It <coughs> looks black. Really, it's too bright to look at. Yeah. Yeah. It's out in the middle of the space. You couldn't, yeah. look. 15, you couldn't look at it, no. You'd, you'd blind yourself. Yeah. Now here is the pen up, <coughs> where it's receiving some, some hot <coughs> material, but it's not. Out here, the, the temperature is Five seven 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 K. Here the temperature is maybe four thousand K here in the penumbra, and here it's maybe thirty-five. You you solar astronomers can tell me if yeah, that's wrong. right. Yeah, you think that's right. approximately right. That's about right. Um, so that's why you have this black spot on the sun. 
Uh, if you looked at it at a different, uh, different wavelength, well, it's cold. Mm -hmm. It's cold. You, yeah. Yeah, well, not a cold. There's a relation it, to the other. Filter, it's cooler. It's change it. Yeah. It's still it's still cooler whether you're looking yeah. at it with HL or not. Um, okay. Um, let's scroll some more. Here I told about the sun's dark continent. How are we doing for time? We have about three minutes left. Okay. We're doing great. We're best. This is a little frustrating thing about the convection zone. The convection zone is the part of the sun that we know least about. We know more about the core than we know about the convection zone. Here's the sun, and here's the core. At about 0.71, there's 0 0.5, 0 0.71, right about there. 71% of the way out to the surface of the sun. From there out to the photosphere, this is the convection zone. There, sunlight cannot get through this area, basically. It's very, very bright down there. Well, you just saw how bright it was. But this material is so opaque, this, the heat, the energy in the sunlight can't get through here. So how does it get through there? By convection. That's why they call it the convection zone. You've got these blobs of hot stuff going up and slightly cooler blobs going down. And I wasn't kidding when I said maybe it's only one degree hotter and one degree cooler. I, I exaggerate a little. Maybe it's a hundred degrees yeah. hotter and a hundred degrees cooler. But convection is such an efficient process. It can transfer, transfer heat from down there up towards the surface, even with, with the, the blobs being almost the same temperature going up and down. Um, so we know little. We know, don't know much about that convection zone. We can't see it. Um, we, we can see some things. We can see magnetic fields. Um, we can see, well, there's uh, the sun. The sun shakes a little bit. Um, <coughs> there's sound waves in the sun, and you, and you can determine a little bit from, from looking at the surface, what the, the photosphere, you can see some things. Um, but really, really in detail, we don't know what's happening there. Um, Dave, it's, 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 you can see the convection cells, right? The HL the cells, which yes. is like water bubbling in a pan. Yes. There's there's two two sizes of convection cells basically. Yeah. Um, the small ones are like 700 to 1,000 kilometers in size, more mm -hmm. or less, mm -hmm. and the big ones are like 30 times bigger. Yeah. And the mystery is, why do you just have the little ones and the big ones? It's like, here's, here's a small size convection cell, and here's a big size convection cell, which is 30 times bigger. Why don't you have a bunch of them that are that big? And some people have thought, maybe there's two convection zones down there instead of one? There's one that's de de detailed, you know, little, little cells like that, and then there's a different area where the cells are this big, I don't know. It's it's that kind of stuff, yeah, basic Dave, stuff that we don't know. There. Okay, there we go. <coughs> this is a spectroheliokinematograph. <laughs> that means that means a movie of the sun taken through an H alpha yeah. filter. Yeah, and you can see it's moving. Isn't that cool? Those yeah. are the little grains. No, I shouldn't say is that. Isn't that cool? Isn't that hot? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Moving on that note, I think. Uh, oh, it's time. I think we will have to. Uh, here, that's the one oh, you want. Yeah, right there. That that's the one well, you want. Well, we're going to see if I can get. Uh, oh, do it there again. we go. Umbra, head umbra, undisturbed photosphere. Mm -hmm. And guess what you're looking at here? Where the those things, are, those are magnetic field lines. Yeah, the, the, yeah. It has texture. Isn't that cool? And look at the bright dots here. There's bright dots there, 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 there. And those are correlated with these, these lines there that show you in the direction of the magnetic field. That is so cool. And the magnetic field is way, way, way stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And the umbra is getting smaller. This is really good. How much? 
much time lapse is that? Oh, it's sped up by very, very fast. 60 to 1 or something, yeah. I don't know. Like every second is a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I, I think it's probably more than a minute. Well, um, we'll see if we can get uh, the full um, handout into the WASP. Well, let's, maybe there's other handouts that can go in the WASP, too. Uh, not all of us. All right, well, if you'd like to ask Dave a question, uh, you can talk to him at the Coney Island on Van Dyke, where we meet after the normal meetings for those that can stay up late. So for next month, uh, we are currently here in the J building. You probably came in from the campus side. If you just continue down the sidewalk through the uh, F and G buildings, E is right on your right here. Um, so you can continue parking in the lots over here, or you can park in the lot yeah. over here. Yeah, we'll just walk. And even here, I think. So, um, so we're not going to be far. We're only two buildings over. But uh, yes. Okay. So I would recommend parking over here. You know why? You won't get lost if you start from here. <laughs> This is going to be through November, so so we are going to be meeting there May, June, July, August, o September, October, and November, and then on January we'll be back here. So so uh, we so Dave's ride actually uh, will not be going to the red coat so, or to the uh, the diner. So. If anyone is going in in the vicinity of uh, Oxford and has three free car seats, uh, please please speak up now. Three? Is it? Okay, two free car seats. Okay. All right. Let's go. Okay. I can take care of this. Oops, it's still going too.